I was going to say, I, I don't have that on me right now. Okay, so I think we're good now. Again? All right. There we go. So summary of the January 4th board work session. Are there any comments, additions, changes to those notes? Seeing nobody, we'll move on to agenda item four, which is public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been uh, held before the board of directors. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to address the board this evening? Seeing nobody, before we get into the rest of the agenda, I have a couple of announcements. One of them is, this is uh, information that's in front of you on the table. The first one is that tonight we do have our uh, board open house upstairs on the seventh floor. Mandatory, mandatory yes. And we for, have food. It's mandatory for everybody in the southwest part of town, Phil Cernanek. Um, so please uh, plan on attending. We are skipping our regular performance and engagement committee meetings so that people can attend this. So if you would, please plan on going up to the seventh floor after this meeting for the open house. I will tell you that the staff always appreciates board members coming up and uh, showing an interest in what they do, and it's good for us to understand better what the different functions are for the Dr. Cog staff. The other item is also in front of you, it's board orientation. This is on Thursday, February 16th at 4 p.m. Strongly encourage anybody, even if you're not necessarily brand new to the board, but if you haven't been through the board orientation, there's always a lot to learn, uh, drinking out of the fire hose kind of when you come on to the Dr. Cog board. So uh, please plan on going to the board orientation Thursday the 16th at 4 p.m to get a better idea of what's going on here at Dr. Cog and your roles and responsibilities. The other announcement that I want to make is we have, I believe, at least one new member who has not uh, been at a meeting yet but is new to the board, and that is from the Board of County Commissioners in Jefferson County, Commissioner Libby Zabo. So welcome. With that, we'll go on to Agenda item number five, which is under attachment B, which is the discussion of Board of Directors' rules of conduct. Mr. Rex. Ooh, I thank you, sir. I, I caught him off guard. <laughs> no, you're fine. Uh, thank you, sir, very much. Um, I'm, well, actually, you know what? I'll just go ahead and kick this right to Mayor Atchison, the uh, chairman of our Performance and Engagement Committee, and he's going to tee it up for Sam Light, our, our legal counsel, to, uh, to get into the details of the new policy. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Uh, as many of you know, especially the P&E group that's here tonight, we have spent several months going through this. Uh, you had a briefing last year, believe it or not, with Sam and uh, oh, John Nicoletti. Nicoletti. That's what I was trying to remember. Nice little young man that comes around and talks about all the secure things you should be doing. Uh, based upon the briefing we've had, uh, the the p and &E group has been working for a number of months to get to a process where we have an ability to deal with issues that come up that involve board directors, the process that we have to go through so that we are established in what we're doing. Uh, a lot have been back and forth about the, the verbiage that's in here. So we have beat it to death. We changed it. We modified it. We put it back. We changed it, modified it, put it back. So it's... It's here for you to review tonight. Uh, this will be a formal action at the board meeting on the 13th, 15th, uh, for adoption. Uh, what I've asked Sam to do is to come in tonight to give us, again, a high-level overview from the legal perspective of what we're doing to protect the board, the individuals who are here, and to make this as much as, a, as possible a safe work environment. Okay, so Sam, if you will. Thank you, Mayor. Um, again, just as a reminder, in October we met with you, John Nicoletti and myself, um, and in follow-up to that safety and liability presentation, the board tasked the Performance and Engagement Committee with creating a rule of conduct policy document for uh, the board. And as the mayor mentioned, the P&E committee has met several times. They discussed and reviewed uh, drafts of a policy document at their November, December, and January meetings. And on their January 4th meeting date, unanimously 
endorsed and recommended to you the documents that you have in your packet uh, this evening. And they are uh, the culmination of that effort. They're here for questions, feedback this evening with the intention being that the documents would be returned at your February 15th uh, meeting for formal uh, consideration. There's two parts to the documents that you have in front of you this evening. There's a set of amendments to the Articles of Association for Dr. Cog, and then there's a draft document entitled Dr. Cog Board of Directors Rules of Conduct. Let me jump into the articles first since that's the, the broader uh, document. The articles amendments will do a couple of things. They will establish the basic framework by first adding a statement recognizing the board's authority to adopt rules of conduct governing its own members. Um, it's envisioned that you'll do that by resolution. So if we bring the back document back to you on uh, February 15th, you'll have a resolution in your packet for your consideration to approve and formally adopt the uh, rules. The other thing that the amendments do is add a line in there that recognizes that the rules of conduct, the policy document, like all your policy documents, is living and breathing uh, item and that there may be occasion to review it and update it as, as time goes on and that that process would occur with review and recommendations by the Performance and Engagement Committee. So we're adding to the Articles of Association an additional power for the P&E Committee to make it clear that they would review and make recommendations to you as a board on your rules of conduct, but you as a board, uh, as an entire board, would then uh, act on those rules. Um, finally, we add to the Articles of an am Amendment uh, a statement that member representatives, that's you, and, and alternates are subject to board rules of conduct. That's on page 7 of the document. And then finally on pages 9, 11, and 12 of the draft articles that are in your packet, we add new language that sets out the basic powers for review and action on complaints. That includes review of a written complaint of a violation by the Performance and Engagement Committee and a referral to the Executive Committee. So I'll talk more about compliance procedures in a minute, but let me uh, back up and talk about the policy objectives of the rules of conduct. So that's the other document in your packet. That's the four-page item that's, I think, the first item as part of the attachment, the draft uh, Dr. Cog Board of Director Rules of uh, Conduct. Let me start my summary by pointing out two things that actually appear at the very beginning and at the very end uh, of the draft because they set out two important and key themes regarding this whole policy document. The first is it says right up front that the document is designed to establish a board embraced set of expectations for conducts of its own members. And it expects or intends that those be self-enforcing. True, we've got compliance provisions and procedures for handling written complaints and have established uh, in the draft uh, a process to do that but the primary intent is that the members familiarize themselves with the rules, um, conduct themselves accordingly, accordingly and essentially self-police and hold each other accountable for the standard of conduct that Dr. Cog as a board and as an organization embraces and expects for its members. Um, so we obviously from a lawyer's perspective in particular you look at the the downstream end of that and you say well what if there is a situation that needs uh, some compliance procedures or some enforcement, we have all that, but we're really looking at the intent of the document on the front end is if this is something the board adopts, it's something the board embraces, holds itself to account for, okay? All right, backing up and getting the document a little bit more, it's organized uh, in this fashion. First, there's a set of rules of conduct followed by the compliance provisions. You'll see with regard to the uh, conduct provisions, we've organized those around the various settings within which you operate as Dr. Cog representative. So, for example, it sets out provisions relating to conduct with each other as board members, and then a section on interaction uh, with the public, and then a section on interaction with uh, staff. There's also, at the front and back end of those three provisions, there's one section about ethics, and there's a section about uh, articulating the board's non-discrimination and workplace safety policy. Those two paragraphs, those in general refer to concepts and requirements that are already recognized in existing law and regulations. But what they do is they elevate them into a board adopted document. So for example, 
you're already bound by the state code of ethics in your role as a representative of a local uh, body. Um, but this just recognizes that by your own document. We recognize that we are committed to ethical conduct. We're not adding new ethical standards, but we are adding a recognition that we do follow the state code of ethics. Similar concept for uh, federal and state non-discrimination and workplace safety. Um, on page three of the document, there is near the top half of that an express statement by the board now, a board embrace statement that Dr. Cog is committed to a workplace that's free of discrimination, harassment, and retaliation, and then we articulate the basis uh, for that and um, put forth the board's the commitment that board members, we as board members, uh, shall not engage in any activities that violate the non-discrimination or workplace safety uh, rules, regulations, and policies that are in place, okay? Um, moving on then to the compliance provisions. So what we've done, and there was much back and forth about um, the exact um, procedures to recommend to you. We looked at a lot of options with the P&E committee, kind of went back and um, tinkered with this or that, uh, and came up with uh, some procedures here uh, that in short provide for the following. Now again, the general theme being self-policing if an issue arises, uh, the policy suggests um, tackle it right then and there. When the behavior occurs, call uh, the offending member into account, see if we can get conformance um, and all, uh, it's the old adage of well, can't we all just get along, right? But if we, if we see something that's concerning and we deal with it right away, uh, maybe that's the end of it and everyone uh, can get back on the same page readily. Uh, but the complaint procedure provides that if there is a written complaint received, then it would be the vice chair of the performance and engagement committee who receives that complaint. That's where the document goes. The vice chair of the P&E committee then lets the board chair know and also then appoints two members from the P&E committee to serve as a panel to review the complaint. So we end up with three individuals taking in that written complaint uh, and reviewing the circumstances of that and then providing a recommendation to the executive committee. Okay, this is all embedded in the document. The recommendation to the executive committee and the executive committee's actions are whatever the committee, executive committee determines appropriate. That could be, for example, a letter of reprimand. It could be re reporting the incident back to the appointing jurisdiction that put the member on the board. Or it could be adopting a finding of no violation because we think as a matter of fairness, if a written complaint is filed, and it uh, involves then the panel asks some questions about what's going on here, what are the circumstances of this. If we find uh, that there was nothing that was, uh, uh, nothing was contrary to the rules, we ought to have a, 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 a essentially a name clearing step to say that that's, that's what occurred. There was no violation uh, found. Uh, so lastly, the, the document styled for adoption by the board um, as a whole by resolution and the intent is to return the document uh, for board action at, uh, at an upcoming meeting. So with that, I'll take any questions you have. There are some provisions I didn't touch on, uh, like for example, if the vice chair is the person who's the subject matter of the complaint, then obviously they're not gonna appoint the panel and they're not gonna sit in review of that, but there are provisions to cover those issues. Um, if the executive committee um, has one of its members who's subject to the complaint, then we have provisions saying that you can't vote on matters involving your own conduct. That's consistent with uh, state law. But the broad theme that I want to emphasize is the non-legal piece of the, the idea of having a board document that the board embraces to set expectations for conduct of its own members and with the implementation piece being uh, self-policing and self-implementing to the extent uh, practical. So with that, I'll take any questions you might have or thoughts or comments on the draft as we move it forward to your next meeting. Dire Director Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much for the overview. That's very helpful. I actually just have a quick question about discretion or privacy uh, and, and what the bylaws allow for, for there. So everyone here is really a, a public official, and should there be some issue with a violation of the code of conduct, is that information quietly kept in this body? Is it is something that might be released to media by virtue of the work that we do here? So I, I think that might be a sensitive matter should we have a very difficult uh, issue or personality on the Board of Directors, and I thought I should ask the question. Mr. Light. It, it may depend on the, it, it will in part depend on the subject matter. You are all 
uh, public officials, and therefore you are bound, and Dr. Cog is bound by Colorado Open Records Law. So we'll look at that, but depending on the subject matter, um, there are certain mandatory obligations that certain information not be disclosed, and then there are discretionary rights to withhold certain information from public disclosure. So we would have to look at that within the circumstances of the particular complaint. Uh, frankly, in working with uh, the people who would receive the complaint, the vice chairs might be having an initial discussion with the complainant as well, right? Uh, if the complaint clearly indicates an expectation of privacy, we may have an issue there of wanting to um, emphasize to that person that they may not be able to keep certain aspects of the documentation private. So we'll have to look at those as they, as they occur. But we'll need to follow the open records law, okay? And that's a balancing act between what our current statutes say about uh, privacy interest is, certain privacy interest in certain subject matters where we will keep that information private, uh, but where we don't have a statutory basis for withholding information, we would be obligated to provide it, okay, in some form. We may end up having to prepare a summary of things that are public and disclosing it that way, okay? But I can't say categorically that everything's confidential or everything's public. Director Christman. I have um, two comments, and they're with the more subjective um, issues of our, the conduct. I do think, um, you know, no problem with discrimination, ethics, all of these issues, but I do think vigorous debate is important. Um, I do believe that we, maybe not all, but most all, our elected officials, hopefully we're not easily offended. Uh, by the way, I've been called uh, an ogress, and if anybody <laughs> would like um, to call me an ogress, I just ask that you call me Madam Ogress. <laughs> um, and I think that this puts a hamper on vigorous debate. When people start to get a little emotional or whatever, there may somebody's feelings may get hurt. I am not saying that we should be uh, cruel, but I do think that in the two areas I'm speaking about is practice um, civility and decorum in discussions and debate and um, avoid making any intentionally intimidating, slanderous, threatening, abusive, or disparaging comments or attacks. I think it's tough to know when somebody else may be intimidated by how uh, another person speaks because they may be angry and aggressive, but they're not intending to intimidate. They're trying to make their point. Um, slanderous, legal term, yeah, fine. Threatening, fine. Abusive, but disparaging. You know, um, I've heard some things that in this council room that I don't think the recipient took as disparaging, but, you know, could be interpreted that way. And I just think this is, this should be a safe room for some debate. And, uh, and if you cross the line a little bit, I don't think you should have your hand slapped. Um, and uh, the same with avoid personal comments that might offend somebody else. I am not easily offended, so everyone here is safe, okay, as far as I'm concerned. But among ourselves, and I'm not talking about how we talk to employees, this does need to be a safe workplace, but amongst each other, I think we need more room so that we can speak without worrying that I might possibly offend somebody. Um, so those are my two comments. Thank you. Can I ask who just came on the line, please? Yeah, Joe Jefferson from Inglewood. Hi, everybody. Thanks, thanks, Director Jefferson. Other comments or questions? Director Graves. Just one uh, quick follow-up to Director Christman. I, I appreciate the comments. I, I don't I don't think that this document goes so far as to limit spirited debate, at least in my view. I think it really just works to establish some level of decorum. And I don't think it's really any different than than Congress or the state legislature. We've had former legislators around the table. I, I think it's okay to have documents in place that try to set the tone for a professional level of discussion. And I, I think uh, I think there have been times in this chamber, even with people who are pretty thick skinned, that it's it's been pretty close to the border, maybe a little over the line by a, a some margin. So I, I, I respect 
um, what we're trying to do here and, and think that this actually will allow for, for free debate and you know pressing a point but reminding folks that there should be some standard of decorum for the body director Williams um, a couple of questions one wondering why it needs to be in the articles of association and not just a policy of the board um, the portions that are in the articles are to empower the process so there's three I think important aspects to that one is the addition of the language that says by accepting appointment as a member representative or alternate you are bound by the rules I think that's something that the board ought to put in its articles um, I suppose it's technically possible to do it by resolution um, and then since you already have the powers and duties of the P&E committee set out in the articles thought it appropriate just to add this additional role to their list of powers and duties there otherwise it would be either set in the rules of conduct document or left as an orphan in some other document so we thought just to make it part of the complete list where someone goes to say what are the roles and responsibilities of P&E we would put it there and the last is the same thing with the executive committee is to go ahead and just put where we say what their responsibilities are say that they have the power and responsibility to act on complaints of violations so and in your opinion you don't think that if an action needed to be taken that it should come to the full board for approval it should just stay within that small committee um, that was the recommendation of the P&E committee um, you know among the permissible options certainly if the board in, in its entirety wanted to do that it I suppose it, it could set up that system I think it would be very difficult in terms of managing that process given the size yeah. all right so I, I just find it problem I just find this problematic because uh, the jurisdictions appoint the person and if we take action and say hey you guys you need to replace your person they don't necessarily have to do that Correct. and so for me it's just a little it's kind of it's kind of hard to figure out how this really will work but there is one residual process that to my knowledge has never been used by this body in its history Roberts rules of order does allow a parliamentary body to undertake a censure at trial um, but that's a very complicated proceeding under Roberts you've never used it it was not the instrument that is designed for something like this so we just left Roberts out of it in in drafting this document and tried to get something that was a less formal smaller setting could more uh, nimbly just take in a concern and try and resolve it informally if necessary still have it resolved through a, a process but still have that process be uh, localized and, and less formal than having a full proceeding by this board as a board so I have director Rakowski but before you start if I could I'd like to recognize Director Atchison. He's the chair of the P&E committee, and I think he probably wants to address that question. Well, I, I think part of it, too, is respecting some level of privacy. You know, just because somebody has a TIF, if we can resolve it at the lowest level, is not to put it in front of a board of 56 people plus the public and everybody else. And I think that's one of the big things we're trying to make sure is that this may be turn out to be nothing, and the decision may be that there's no violation. Do we want to advertise that to a 56-person board that there was an accusation that has no founding? I don't think so. And I think that's one of the reasons that we spent so much time making sure that we can try to secure privacy in this as much as possible. But also, there's a process by which action can be taken. Your point about the board, let's say we have an incident that has to go to the appointing of authority. If they choose not to do anything with that person, that's their choice. We're not going to make that choice, but they need to understand that the person representing them has got a problem here. And it could end up being a legal matter that leaves the board and involves them. Director Rikowski. Counselor, um, how many years have you been with the organization? Um, 20. Great. You don't look it. <laughs> uh oh. But my question, <laughs> but my question is, in your knowledge of board activities, other than this uh, current situation, 
Are you aware of anything in the previous 20 years that would have been better handled had this been in existence? Um, boy, I am older than I look <laughs> because I'm racking my memory to issue, try and think of circumstances we have that come up. You know, we have, uh, whether it's with prior officers um, or with staff on occasion, our office will be involved uh, at a minimum as a sounding board in saying how do I handle this or that issue of conduct uh, involving a, a board member. Um, but we haven't had any that have gone uh, to a situation where we had to bring it to this full board. So. Thank you. Thank you. Director Zabel. Thank you. And I'm new to this. Last night was the first time I read all of this. Um, so excuse me if this has been gotten over. Um, it, it, as a, a director in Dr. Cog, um, do we have any acknowledgement that this is the way we will conduct ourselves? or? How does, how does that work? Is this, you know, as part of our work here, we acknowledge this through, I don't know, signature or raise our right hand and put it on the Bible, whatever, however you do it. Uh, is there any type of acknowledgement or is this doc, uh, document just going to be out there and some of us might read it, you know, someone who gets put on the board in five years and it's deep down in a... Uh, you know, a set of um, rules and regs somewhere in there. How, how is all that going to work so that I guess we do know how to act? A couple of themes on that. So on the, 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 the being bound portion of that, so the changes that will happen to the Articles of Association will expressly say that by accepting appointment, you as a member agree to be bound by the rules of conduct that the board as a board adopts. Uh, we talked about the Ex the addition of an express signature line at the P&E committee um, and decided not, not to include that. We think if the board as a board adopts the rules, then uh, part of being a member of the board is agreeing to commit to those. That doesn't mean that people may have disagreements on how they apply or that you may have situations that need to be looked at and they may turn out to uh, have merit and require some compliance measures or not have merit and, as the, the mayor said, be ones that then ought to just be set aside. Um, so there's that. As far as getting the word out on those, it's, it's staff's intention, and we mentioned at the bottom that the documents, the rules of conduct be made available at orientation and in training materials, and staff will probably look at opportunities with the board to have, uh, you know, training opportunities to go over these, to kind of keep these out in front, uh, consistent with my initial comment that in order for them to work best, everyone's got to be familiar with them and embrace them and not go looking for them <laughs> somewhere when something comes up and we, we've got something somewhere that speaks to that. We should have a working familiarity with um, the expectations that we're trying to set for ourselves. So, so I want to comment on that as well. Um, Sam is right that we talked about whether or not we would actually have a signature line and, and no, no, I, I, and I do, the, the uh, unan not unanimous, the majority response was not to do that. However, uh, the staff does have a very specific onboarding process and that onboarding process includes uh, familiarization with that and February 16th, 4 p.m., <laughs> board orientation. Uh, other questions or comments? <laughs> nice handoff, Libby. I'm sorry, Director Jones. Well, I just wanted to uh, thank the P&E committee for dealing with this issue so carefully. I know it, it was an investment of time. I actually think that you landed in a good spot in terms of um, setting expectations, but also respecting privacy and providing for some action if indeed that's needed, but with the expectation that hopefully it won't be because everybody will understand that we all need to behave ourselves um, and act respect respectfully even while we spiritedly debate. And uh, so I think that's a, it's a, an important balance to um, achieve, and I think you've done that. So um, I'm prepared to support these and encourage others to do as well. Uh, Mr. X has thank a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, and thank everybody for the comments this evening. Uh, you know, maybe we'll just get 
a simple head nod as to if you guys feel comfortable with this moving forward to the board. Um, and if that is the case, I would suggest um, just a, rem a reminder, because this is an amendment to our articles, it will require a majority of the members. So it's 30, whatever it is now. 29. 29. 29, sorry. So just FYI, please be at the next meeting. So again, we don't have formal, mo formal motions and votes as this body, but if there's anybody that has concerns about moving this forward, if you could wink your right eye or something. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll assume that, that everybody's okay with this moving forward. All right, very good. So we are on to agenda item six, which is attachment C. Um, couple of comments before Mr. Rex gets into his presentation. Uh, just kind of as reminder, in August 2015, the Board of Directors established the working group that worked on this um, this document that we're going to be discussing uh, probably not just tonight, but in the, in the next couple of meetings to come. Uh, on February 17th of 2016, staff presented a white paper to the Board of Directors um, and the work groups, uh, the work group was established to start looking at what this uh, new recommend recommendation for the TIP cycle would be. I wanted to point out that on the, on the formal document itself, if you look at the second page, the back page, I just wanted to acknowledge the working group and the people that uh, spent a lot of time uh, making the recommendations to this body. So just take a quick look at that. I'd like to recognize the, the hard work that they did to get us where we are. And then I'll turn it over to Mr. Rex for his presentation. Thank you very much, Madam, uh, Madam Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, appreciate it. Uh, you know, and I really do appreciate you recognizing the members of the committee because we met 18 times over the last oh, year or so. Um, a lot of discussion, debate. With their, not much yelling, but uh, there was uh, plenty of discussion and debate, to be honest. And uh, I think we came up with a, uh, with a scenario for your consideration that um, that I'm uh, curious to get your reaction to. Um, I would, I, well, first of all, I kind of feel like that guy, right? That guy that you know just can't let a good thing last for a while. Here we are, two weeks ago, approving Metro Vision, the celebration of, and now I'm here talking about the tip. Not even a month later, two weeks later. But um, but I think part of that part of this discussion would be, and um, I'll get into this in a second, is um, the reason we were we did we did decide that you all decided to. Uh, allow us to look at other models throughout the country is because there were some that felt a little disenfranchised by by the tip process last time it lasted 18 months and I swore that I was never going through that again so um, so here we are but I would like to first recognize as the chairman did I would like to recognize the members of the tip review work group that are actually present tonight um, we have Gene Shreve from Adams County Janice Finch from C City County of Denver uh, we have Kent Mormon from Thornton, Matt Callison from Aurora, Brian Weimer from Arapahoe County, um, our own Steve Cook served formerly on the TIP Review Work Group, as well as uh, you know additional staff at Dr. Cog that, that staffed that function with Todd Cottrell and, uh, and Brad Calvert as, as well as others. So thank you all very much for your effort. I'm just a pretty face up here giving this presentation, but it's really the... Uh, <laughs> so if, if we could have those folks just stand up real quick and be recognized. No, thank you all very much. We appreciate that. Um, as far as handouts within your packet, um, you have a, uh, a few handouts, of course, the presentation, but also the, the actual report from the TIP Review Work Group. This is the, the second of two reports that the work group has done. The first was a, was a white paper um, that kind of lay out the, the concepts that we're going to talk about this evening. Uh, that was linked within your packet as well. Um, and then we also provide a kind of a summary of the recommendations that are within the, the, the report because they're kind of scattered throughout, so we thought it would be a good idea if we just do a summary of those um, so you can have a read at your, at your leisure. So here we go. Um, oh, yeah, we have additional copies of, of, of all the above if anybody needs it, the report as well as the summary of recommendations. Okay. All righty, just a little bit of background because I know we have some new faces here um, and quite frankly, even since we began this whole process, there's been quite a bit of turnover on the board, so I think it's important just to provide a little background as to where we are. Um, 
when we, after the completion of the, of the Transportation Improvement Program, well, first of all, the Transportation Improvement Program is a federally required document. It's kind of a, our short-range plan. It's kind of the MPO's CIP, for example. It, it lists the projects that are going to be um, constructed over, the, over a four-year period. Um, and I know you're saying, well, it, tip, it says 2016 through 2021, which is six years. Um, but we only ever fund the first four years of that TIP. Um, the, the, the remaining two years were really kind of open for CDOT so that they could include um, uh, out-year monies within that. Future TIPs, we're not going to do that, though. We're just going to have the, the four years. So uh, just a little FYI on that. Um, so like I said, so back in August of 2015, um, as we always do after the completion of the TIP, we, uh, we do what we at least call internally a TIP postmortem, and we, uh, we approach the, our, 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 our TAC, our, our Transportation Advisory Committee, um, to get their opinions, reactions, what went well, what things didn't, what things can we improve on, those types of things. And um, we shared that information with you all when we had our own TIP postmortem. And um, you guys had your own comments and, uh, and directed at that time the development of this TIP review work group. And the whole concept of that was to, uh, there were several things really. The one was to explore other models throughout the country of how they allocate their TIP dollars. Um, and also, I, I guess, you know, in a nutshell, really to look at those concerns and ways to improve it so that the next TIP round, um, you know, goes maybe even smoother than, than the last. And the, uh, the result of that white paper, which was February of 2016. <laughs> no, no cynicism, Director Sardanic. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. So in February 2016, um, the, white, the, the uh, tip review work group um, brought back the white paper that I mentioned with five recommendations, and those are listed on your screen and in your packet. Um, but the one that we really focused in on was um, uh, this whole concept of this regional, sub-regional dual model. And uh, just from our, from our preliminary analysis, you know, we didn't see any fatal flaws associated with it. Um, so we thought it was, you know, it, it was worthy of, you know, uh, you know, further exploration with the concept that if, if it does indeed, uh, you know, fit, fit what we, um, you know, fit us, that uh, is something we might want to explore a little further. So, um, so the board directed, after we presented the recommendations, you all directed us to uh, continue the investigation of the recommendations, and we reconvened that group in April of 2016. And here we are today, several months later, with, uh, with, with, the, uh, with our report and, and recommendations. So the purpose of the report is really twofold. One is really, it really does focus on the, the regional, sub-regional dual model, which I, from here on out, will just call the dual model. Um, for its goodness of fit for this region. And we, that's what we concentrate in most of our meetings on. And we also did provide an update um, on the white paper recommendations, and that's one of my last slides here this evening too. But, um, but so we've, you know, we felt we just wanted to give you an update on those too. So just again, a little bit of background. Those who have been around for some time have recognized this flow chart. Um, this is kind of the way we develop the tip and allocate our monies right now. Um, this, this is really just a refresher for you all and for you new, newbies here, just to give you some concept on how we do that. So before we ever do a call for projects, what we typically do, um, we set aside some money, well, typically, historically, we've set aside monies for, for various regional programs that are either run by Dr. Cog or partnering agencies. And those, um, and those are really in two different categories. The first is in actual set-aside programs. Um, these historically have been funded. Um, our transportation demand management program, that is, most of these, well, several of these are separate call for projects that we get that money back out to you all in a, in a separate way from, the, from the, uh, the general call for projects, and the TDM pool is certainly that. So that goes to fund, you know, smaller, infra smaller infrastructure projects for bicycle pedestrian, um, improvements to transit facilities, those types of things. Um, way to go, that's our, that's our Dr. Cog carpool program. And um, uh, I, I know most of you all are familiar with that. Our traffic operations program, we brought last month um, uh, some of the criteria that we will be using in a, a call for projects for our traffic operations program. And that, that, that uh, program is funded out of this pot. 
uh, station area urban center uh, or stamp projects. Uh, these are, uh, are these are studies that are associated with. Um, well, they were originally associated with the uh, fast track stations. Um, we've been, we've expanded that to include uh, um, studies within uh, the Dr. Cog urban centers as well. And air quality, um, that is primarily money that, is, that goes towards uh, air quality public education um, and uh, like diesel retrofit programs and, and stuff like that, that we really sub-allocate that to the Regional Air Quality Council uh, or the RAC. So that's a set aside on, you know, that, we, that we historically have done. And the other side, you know, through several TIF cycles, we've, set ex we've, we've, um, we've apportioned money to these larger, you know, big mega projects that um, uh, that we've we've had a request a request to fund before we ever do the call for projects, and uh, you will see over oh I think maybe two three tip cycles now fast tracks we've in, included um, money for fast tracks. There was a first commitment in principle which went to primarily infrastructure for fast tracks, and then there was a second commitment in principle. Um, that uh, went to the communities along the fast tracks corridors that they can begin to um, prepare themselves for the for the expansion of fast tracks. So those uh, those have been in previous tips and were in the, in the in the current tip as well. The new project this last time around was the I-70 East project or Central 70. Um, the board uh, agreed to f to um, uh, include 50 million dollars for that project, 25 million in this current tip, and 25 million in the next tip. All right, so that's all the set aside. So once that was all done. Um, the money that was left was about $274, $75 million, and uh, we do a call for projects. What did I say? Oh, $175 million. Let the record state. Um, no, and, uh, <laughs> right, yeah, what am I doing? I need, <laughs> no, um, yeah, so we do a call for projects, and we're, we're very typical, like other MPOs across the country. There's really only two ways of doing this, right? There's a centralized version and a decentralized version. The centralized version, I would suggest to you that it is probably upwards of 85 to 90 percent of the MPOs across the country do this. And basically, um, uh, member local governments submit projects to the MPO, to Dr. Cog, and um, we you know, we go through those projects, make sure you all follow the criteria the way that it was established by you all, and then we rank the projects. And the other way to do that is to centralize, and I'll we'll talk about that a little bit, because that's kind of what the dual model does, and the, uh, there, there are fewer that do it that way. So, um, so we have always done it in two phases, our selection process. The first phase, 75% of the money is allocated, and it is based on the, the, uh, the criteria, the objective criteria that you all um, um, uh, agree and approve prior to the call. And um, so basically we just line up the projects based on these targets that are in, the, in this first box. And so for roadway capacity, for example, we, we rank the projects, roadway capacity projects, until we get to 38% per of 131 million in this case. And, um, and we just cut it. Those projects are funded. Well, with your approval, they're funded. And then the projects that don't get funded in first phase, they then float over to the second phase. And the board has a lot more discretion about how to fund that pot. Um, there are other criteria, other factors that are, that are considered as part of this pot. And you can see that's the remaining money, the 25%. And this last time around, um, besides the criteria, they also, you guys also considered, I think there was five or six different ones. Um, probably the one we had, the, I know we had the most discussion about was geographic equity. Uh, you all will remember that to those who were around. So geographic equity, um, did the project have a first final mile component to it? Those types of things. And um, so it allows, so, and then we fund the remaining money. So that is our process. And um, if you look at the tip map, which maybe I, I wish I kind of included now, you will see that we really do have a pretty good spatial distribution of projects throughout our region. Um, and I don't think anybody would suggest that, you know, that the projects that ultimately were sort of selected were, were wrong. It was just kind of the process was, you know, was a little disconcerting at times, and I, and I, I, I can understand that. So that is the current process. What we, the TIP Review Work Group, are recommending looks something like this. And this is just, a, just, just for a concept. 
So right now we kind of have two pots, right? I know I'm not supposed to call them pots. I mean, I, I, my tip review work group folks, uh, we, well, I'm supposed to refer to them as shares, but it's just easier for me to say pots. Um, so we really kind of had three pots of this. It's kind of, you know, we have our traditional set-aside pot still, and then we have, um, uh, this is where it gets new. We have a regional share or regional pot, um, and the previous commitments uh, would, would, would be funded out of this, and that would be the I-75 pro I project, as well as the fast track commitments if, it's still, if it still exists, and next Todd Cottrell saying yes, we still will have fast track commitments in the, in the next tip. And, uh, but this, and I'll, I'll speak to this a, in more detail here in a minute, but I just want to give you a concept of the pots. So there's the regional pot, and then the sub-regional pot. In the sub so the regional pot projects, that money would go to these large transformative projects, whatever that means. Now let me, just, let me just say from the outset, and I probably should have said this earlier, that what I'm presenting tonight is really the framework for this, this model. The guts, you know, still has to be developed as to, you know, what transformative mean. And we'll define that for you all. Well, we will, but you all will ultimately. Um, approve this and it, and whomever is responsible for the development of the TIP policy document that will flush out all these details, the board obviously will be involved in every step of the way on that providing direction and approval of, of the various concepts. So that's the, so that's the regional pot and the sub-regional pot, the concept would be that um, a share of the overall money would be proportionally allocated to some predefined geographic unit, right? So for, for, uh, to do a kind of a separate call for projects. And the whole concept associated with that was that th it, it is an opportunity to, while still be consistent with MetroVision and the Regional Transportation Plan, it is an opportunity to express local values that you have within your communities about how you believe this money should be spent to be consistent with those two documents. So it provides more flexibility, we believe, ultimately in the selection process um, for the Dr. Cog money. Um, I will point out that you will see right at the end here that we have this big blue box that talks about Dr. Cog board final project selection. Um, and the reason for that is because the projects that come out of, well certainly the regional pot, because the board will have direct control over that, that the, out of the sub-regional share, the projects that are selected there will, uh, will uh, are are uh, recommendations back to the full board. The board has ultimate authority to accept those recommendations or not. And this is, um, quite frankly, I just think it's good practice in some respects, but it's also fulfilling a federal requirement with regards to the transparency and the ability. Because you cannot, we cannot, federal government cannot sub-allocate monies directly to um, any one entity. So there's there's that whole discussion. I don't want to get in the weeds with that, but this, this is kind of fulfills that requirement for Federal Highway and FTA. Okay, so the dual model. So um, I'm going to talk about each of those pots, but first of all, right from the outset, all of our discussions that we had, um, the one thing we always came back to was that we want this time around and in the future, we would like the board, our recommendation is the board to have a very conscious discussion about what it is you hope to accomplish with this pot of money. And I don't, I know that didn't happen last time. I think we get so caught up in the weeds sometime about the criteria and, you know, how many points for this, how many points for that, that we forget, right, about what it is we're trying to do with this money. So what the, what the, the work group is recommending, and I, and I hope you guys take to heart, is that we'd like the, for the board to have a conscious discussion about what you hope to do and establish some focus areas which you believe this money should be spent towards. And then once that's established, then we, we, whoever we is who develops the criteria for your consideration, will base at least in, in, in to some degree that those focus areas um, will base the criteria on those focus areas. So I would suggest to you, for example, like safety, right? Um, I, I would think that that would be a pretty high priority for the board, that pro projects that are selected should improve safety. Quite frankly, it's a federal requirement, so I mean, it, even if you don't, we're going to have to do that. But, um, but for example, so, and, and, um, so, so again, I won't belabor the point, but we really think there's an opportunity here for, um, for you to have this discussion at this summer's board retreat or board workshop. Um, we will probably, you know, we'll, we'll, um, 
will initiate this discussion in the months leading up to that board workshop, but we think it's a good opportunity, and it, it's, a probably a, it's, it's a pretty good product to come out of that workshop, so it would be a good working meeting. Um, it's, if you have any questions or comments about any of these topics as I go through, please just, just shout it out. I'd be happy to answer them as we go through. Um, don't, don't, don't shout it out. Address the chair appropriately. <laughs> Director Cernanek. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Doug, for a good start. Um, <laughs> uh, when, um, I mean, one of the items that we've discussed uh, earlier has been system-wide principles and being in a position where uh, those principles are, we actually do have a discussion and debate and resolution as to how they're going to be measured, uh, whether we're talking about regional projects and um, I have some sub-questions that get down to detail, which is a, uh, something may or may not be a regional project, but it may not impact all of the region. Sure. Uh, so, uh, you know, how do we um, get to the point where we understand what's regional and sub-regional and have that? And that doesn't have to be answered tonight, Doug, uh, but it's, a, it's an item for further work. Uh, secondly, is uh, in the document it talks about public entities and entities that qualify for federal funds. Right. Uh, when we're talking about transportation dollars, uh, which is where we're starting, my suggestion is is to narrow that definition uh, so that uh, it doesn't get misconstrued when we start talking about forums that may not have uniformly board membership on uh, those that those forums actually understand what that what that means in the context that we're dealing with because um, some organizations that are eligible for federal funds um, aren't necessarily anywhere close to transportation right and so uh, those would be some things to provide some some clarification on and um, um, and I'll just go back to the process of um, we ought to be starting our dialogue and discussion around system-wide principles uh, way in advance of the workshop. Great. Thank you, sir, very much. No, and I appreciate those questions, and you're exactly right. I mean, I'll, I'll speak to your second question first with regards to, um, you know, providing some discretion as to what groups, you know, could be eligible for this. I mean, I, I would. I mean, I might throw that back to you all, right? I mean, ultimately, when we have that discussion, if we, if it is the desire of the board to go forth with this, that I will, we will look to you all to put curbs on exactly, you know, the the, the types of groups or you know that that uh, might be eligible for to be applicants, right? But I would, I would uh, suggest to you that the projects that would be submitted would have to have a transportation purpose. Um, so just you know, kind of FYI on that. On your on your system-wide principles, um, I also hear you on that, and um, I I appreciate you saying I don't have to have the answer this evening because I don't to some degree, but I do think that that is part of the discussion going forth that the tip review work group or whomever that group is will have in flushing out the details of this. There are certain federal requirements that we are going to have to comply with, of course, with regards to performance management, and. Um, um, you know, we're still, you know, we just got the final rule, which is now on hold for 60, 90 days, whatever it is. But, um, but yeah, so those details will be worked out within the actual planning documentation as we go forth. But thank you for that, and we will be considering those as we go forth. So I have Director Malay, but I want to make a quick comment before um, a couple of things. First of all, I think that's a good segue, Director Cernanek, to the, to the fact that part of this is that we're going to have a working group, a TIP working group, made up of board of directors members as well as other people and i think we have our first volunteer um so no that and that is part of the part of the goal here the other thing is i wanted to mention since the board workshop has been uh, brought up just as a reminder that's august 25th and 26th so um certainly we don't anticipate that it's going to take all that time to for this working group to come up with some recommendations but that will be uh, part of the topic of conversation at that workshop in August 25th and 26th where this working group was gotten. Director Malay. I, I actually was going to speak to kind of some of the similar things you just mentioned. I think it's important to recognize that 
Phil and I have had the privilege, along with a couple others at this table, of going through this a number of times. But I think for people new to the process, I really like what you're saying, that we are not going to arbitrarily assign percentages. And if there are road projects that exceed the 38 percent, we can actually fund them. And that this is going to give us some local control and flexibility. And so I think the devil is always going to be in the details. And, and I probably could ask you a list of questions. But I, but I really hope we can all be open to this new concept of allowing us the flexibility, local control, not arbitrary percentages, and I really want to compliment the, the efforts of the working group and looking forward to hearing more. Great. Thank you, Director. Director Stolzman. Thank you. I, I just have a couple of questions following on to the Chair's comments. Um, was, has the working group already been discussed um, previously by the board, and is that group going to be inclusive, or is that an exclusionary group, and what process are we going to use to establish that? Um, I'll let sure. Mr. Rex talk about that, but I think it's, it hasn't been established yet. It's just a concept. It, it, it is just a concept. Um, you know, in our original white paper, I believe we, uh, at least it was a soft recommendation about who the, the policy body or you know, the body who, who develops the TIP policy document for consideration by the full board should be, like last time, it was our it was NVIC, and um, you know I, I don't think there was many anybody on the TIP review work group that felt that maybe that was the most appropriate body because there was you know it was it was made up of elected officials. No disrespect, but there was no no technical expertise on that committee, and I think sometimes there was there was some frustration by board members because you know I mean a lot of this is stuff you, I know you guys don't deal with every day and. All that kind of good stuff. So there, the, there was a soft recommendation that um, that the work group going forward um, may, maybe be some kind of a mix between elected officials and staff, and that had been done previously. Um, now, as you will see later on in my presentation, that the work group is actually recommending that they continue to be the um, kind of the that policy development or policy document developer. Um, and that's open for discussion, of course. I mean, that's nothing but a recommendation, and there could be some kind of happy medium in between. But Director Malay and the Director Jones. But but we are going to decide oh, what yeah. that is. This body, the the elected officials are going to decide who that is. I actually agree that the the TAC, the technical experts, really take the first cut at it. But their recommendations would always be brought forth to this body to make the decisions. We are the decision makers. They are the recommenders. Yes. So, um, and none of this has been worked out. I mean, I think it's so conceptual right, um, right now. I exactly. just want to make sure we recognize that the ultimate decision making will always rest here at this table Definitely. by, and by I, the elected. I appreciate that clarification and it is true. I mean we will be constantly coming back to either um, the the uh, board work session or our actual board meeting with with recommendations and in search of direction from you all and all that kind of good stuff. So um, so stay tuned. Director Jones. I just point of process clarification. I have plenty of comments. You haven't finished your presentation so I'm going to suggest maybe you finish your presentation, but if this is the time to make comments, I'll, I'll start talking. But I'm thinking it would work better if I waited till Doug's done. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay, um, so that's the tip-focused area. Um, so set-asides, I've already talked about that, um, what, our, what our current set-asides are. Um, we have made a commitment. It, well, we recommended in our TIP white paper, and we recommend within this report that we evaluate all those existing programs to make sure that we are getting the benefits that we desire out of those programs. Um, and um, you know, it, just because these are our existing programs, it doesn't mean you know we couldn't add some additional ones too, based on what your focused areas might be, all that kind of good stuff. So, so that's the set asides. Okay, regional share. I talked about these transformative projects, right? And, um, you know, it's one of those that we, we had a difficult time, I would think, like defining what those are. It's kind of, you know, you know it when you see it type of thing. Um, in some respects, you know, I would suggest it's like major infrastructure projects, I mean, or programs. It could be some, there could be some large regional programs that really move the needle on, on some stuff. But ultimately, what we'd like to do with, uh, with this regional share, well, I guess it's twofold. Um, one, we'd like the applicants uh, that we get, we, those projects, we want to be able to quantify the benefits of those projects to the region. Um, and uh, 
we haven't fully developed exactly how that would be done, but that it would be uh, something that the, uh, that the next group would do. But we think that's important to be able to show how the, the, that project would, um, would benefit the region in the short term and in the long term. So, uh, so that, that was a, that was, there was certainly unanimous consensus about that. The other thing we've talked about is that, you know, this larger money, th this regional pot would, um, um, would primarily, and I use that word primarily, not, not always, but would primarily would supplement some larger regional projects by our member, uh, by our uh, regional partners, whether that be CDOT, RTD, others. Um, you know, it might be that little bit of money, that extra money that gets them over the top to fund the project. Um, and we kind of just left it at that. But, um, but we thought that was, that was pretty important. It doesn't have to be. I mean, there will be some larger regional projects that, they, that the board may feel strongly about, um, you know, funding completely. But I think, bless you. But I think, you know, um, you know the concept would be that it would be to, to supplement these larger projects because, it's, you know, quite... In relative terms, we don't have a lot of money. I mean, the tip money that we get represents about two to three percent of the total revenue for transportation that's that's used within the within the Dr. Cog area. So it's not a lot of money. Um, most of that money, of course, comes from you all, local governments, and then the improvements that you all do, and uh, CDOT and RTD. So that's the. Oh, uh, the other uh, other concept that I, I'd like to raise that was that was talked about in the in the report was that um, come selection time of regional projects, so there would be a separate call for the regional projects. People would submit projects with their how they how this is going to improve the region. The, the suggestion was that to form a, a subcommittee of the board, a task force, let's say, to um, to actually vet those projects and provide recommendations back to the full board so the board, the full board would not be vetting that. Um, it's just, it, it was just a concept that's worth considering and that's something we can flush out as we get further down the line. But um, there seemed to be some merit to that. Seattle, uh, Puget Sound Regional Council, which this is kind of the model that they use, a, a dual model. They, th that's the way they operate there and um, we thought there was some merit to that. Okay, sub-regional share. Um, again, the funds would be proportionally targeted to predefined sub-geographic units for project identification and recommendations. Um, and the, the, uh, the work group was recommending counties be, be that sub-geographic unit. I think there's some obvious reasons for that. Um, there's already a very comfortable relationship among the jurisdictions within a county. Um, CDOT's public hearing process uh, you know, they meet individually with those counties, so there's an opportunity there for better coordination of projects between CDOT and Dr. Cog. Um, and we also think there's an opportunity here be, uh, for, for um, um, to encourage cooperation and collaboration across county lines on these larger, larger infrastructure projects and programs that, you know, we, we know there's already cross banter amongst counties on projects now and uh, this would just encourage and enhance that and we believe that has uh, certain, certainly has a, uh, um, a degree of regionalism to that. Um, but um, the other thing I would like to mention that the work group felt very strongly about was that sub-regional share, whatever that might be, um, it needs to be meaningful. And I will show you an example here in a minute of uh, of you know what that might what that sub-regional share might look like, but they felt pretty strongly that it needs to be meaningful. In that, um, you know, if they're going to do a whole separate call for projects, um, you know, there you know, it needed to be enough money in that pot to actually do it to make it worth their while, and um, so that that's uh, that's the other concept. So as far as proportionately proportionately uh, uh, targeted funds and how that money would be allocated to, to the sub-regions. Um, we never really arrived at an answer on that because we think it's, it's just better place that discussion once you approve this concept and you know the tip review work group or whomever will have further discussion about this. But we do believe it will be some combination of population, employment, vehicle miles traveled, person miles traveled, similar to kind of the conversation that we had on the, on the, uh, on the um, geographic equity concept. Now I'm just going to show you an example here, and please, this is only for discussion. Um, so to give you some, re oh, we have a question. Do you, do you mind if I interrupt? Yes. Director Brockett. 
Thank you. Just before we get into the details of the funding, just in terms of thinking about the regional versus the sub-regional projects, it seems like if the sub-regional projects are at a county level, it seems like the definition of a regional project would be one that crossed county lines. Is that safe to say, or could you have cross-county projects that could be funded at the sub-regional level? Uh, Say so could, could you have cross just cross county projects that funded at funded the, the sub regional level? At the sub region, yes. yes. Okay. Um, we've talked about concepts in which you know counties, you know, there's a tremendous infrastructure need, whatever that might be, that crosses county lines. They could pool their money together in order to accomplish that in partnership. Um, Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, I would like to just the, the first part of your question with regards to. Um, you know, county level projects. That's that's a concept that we really we, I mean, we we had a discussion about with regards to you know because it, the projects are selected at sub regional level, are they regional projects, right? And I would suggest to you that if you look at our current tip projects that we have funded, all regional projects are local in some respects, um, but they together they collectively create a benefit to the region. Right, I mean those just targeted projects, you know, a, an improvement on on Ridgegate Parkway, for example, in Lone Tree, you know, in in and of itself will really help traffic within that area, but it's part of a larger improvement that we require at the regional level. We improve the level of service across the entire region, for example. So I know that's been a been a uh, a question that I've had um, previously. Okay, so here is the example, and we kind of did a range, right? Just so you get kind of get a feel for how much money um, might might flow down to the subregions. So in this example, we kind of we so the range we did we did a 50-50 uh, scenario and a 30-70 scenario. 30 percent going to this to the region, 70 percent going to the subregion. So under the uh, under the scenario. First of all, you would set aside the $40 million. Um, we used the $40 million is arbitrary. It was what was used last tip cycle. So we just use that again, just for, just for illustrative purposes. And we also bumped up the total number too. We think the total we'll get for the next tip call will be around 280 or so, right? So we strip across the 240, or the, the 40 million, that leaves us with 240. And if you split that 50 50, that's 120 in the regional pot, 120 in the subregion, 30 70. 72 in the uh, regional and 168 in the sub-regional. So what we did for this example only is that um, so if, when you allocate that sub-regional share proportionately and what we used as factors for this or variables was only population and employment. Those were the two. We didn't factor in VMT, PMT, anything else. Um, we had those numbers readily available quite honestly and that's the reason we used them. And as we discovered in our the whole geographic equity concept um, in the last tip call, the numbers really don't move a whole lot regardless how you factor these variables in. Um, so that's kind of just on the side. I just wanted to mention that. So you'll see. So, um, and I hope everybody can see this or can see it on the screen. If not, I'll, I, can, I can yell out the numbers here. Um, but it gives you some concept of what we're talking about um, with regards to how much the, the sub-regional sub -regional forms will have um, to, um, to allocate. Mr. Chairman, you have a question? Director Dyack. So um, I just kind of, and I understand it's only an example. Yes. And these are just very high level for uh, educational purposes only. But uh, when you put up the, the 2016 uh, tip, uh, the percentage of regional share was 19.65% relative to the overall pot. So I know the percentages, but I guess sort of my, my, my thoughts would be to kind of go back in time and see if there was some sort of percentage of regional to sub-regional that you can kind of cull out a previous and let the, let the advisory committee have that to sort of guide the percentages sure. that, that they talk about. Yeah. No, good point. And we've had, we had that discussion at, at the tip review work group as well. Um, but of course, I don't think it's, it's not truly apples to apples though, because, um, you know, what we defined as regional, um, you know, in our current process are those that are in the blue boxes, right? But 
I would suggest to you that there are, pro there are probably projects that were included in this call that you could define as regional. That's just me. Um, yeah, but I, I think it's depending upon the definition of what is regional that, that the TIP committee will come back to yeah. us. And um, that'll change, but I mean, to me, the 50-50, the 70-30, if there's an 80-20, um, you know, I just, again, if, if, if there's a way to, to tease that out, yes. just provide that to them. No, we definitely discussion. Will, yeah. Definitely. Thank you, sir. Okay, any, any questions on that part? Oh, let me just get through the rest. I'm almost done. Okay, so, so this is more on the sub-regional share. So on the governance side, so now you've seen, you know, how much money potentially would flow down through, to, through, through, the, to, to, through the, the individual sub-regions, right? Um, so how would it be governed? How would people select projects? So the whole concept would be to, to d establish these, what we're calling regional forums, um, to coordinate the project uh, prioritiz prioritar prioritization process, easy for me to say. Um, and within, so when I say that the subregion is counties, it's counties with a little c. The, the county, county government, big C, would not control the process. Every community, including the county, would have a seat at the table, right? They would have one seat at the table, every community within, within, the, within, the, uh, within the county, and then that regional forum would then select a chairperson. Right, so and then you would just follow normal rules and how that would be done. Um, so it would, so you would have, um, so each local government would be invited to participate. Of course, they wouldn't have to participate if they didn't want to, but they would have that option. Um, it was, it's our recommendation that CDOT and RTD also be included on that on that regional forum as non-voting members. And again, it is up to you all. You have that flexibility. You can include them as voting members if you want, as well as other stakeholders. There could be other stakeholders within your within your county that you feel, you know, are big players within this that you would like to have included. I don't know who they might be, but you know, but, but you had that option. Um, so that would be the governing unit. Um, as far as project eligibility, and uh, Director Malay spoke to this earlier with regards to, you know, in the past we've established targets. I say we, the board, has established targets and how we, how we hit those. Um, we, the, the TIP Review Work Group, is recommending to keep that as, po as flexible as possible in order to allow local jurisdictions to determine the best way to, to address the transportation issues within your region. Um, uh, but of course the projects have to be federally eligible and all that kind of good stuff. And Dr. Cog's staff, we will be staffing the, all those regional forums so they will make sure that you're, we're all in compliance with federal law and all that kind of good stuff. So, um, uh, so yes, yeah, so, so that's it on project eligibility. Okay, so on evaluation criteria, um, I think we can kind of, you know, continue this whole concept of being flexible. Um, we're we're uh, recommending kind of a hybrid approach to this. We do believe that there are some universal criteria that should be in included in uh, in every sub-regional forums cr uh, uh, criteria that they use for selection of projects. Most of those deal with federal requirements, um, you know, uh, safety congestion, uh, environmental justice, ADA type stuff. Um, which are, are um, which are federal federal partners who also sat in on these uh, tip review work group meetings felt strongly about, um, but and you know, so so you got that so you got things that universally would be applied to all of them um, as well as criteria that um, that would address those tip re, those uh, tip focus areas that the board establishes later on uh, this summer, and then the sub regional uh, forums have. Have the um, have the option to create additional criteria in order to flush out a little more, um, you know, some of the local values, some of your local priorities that you all have um, within your communities. So that's really it on the dual model. Um, I just want to point out real quick on the on the TIF schedule. Um, I can't believe that we you know we've got to ramp this up as quickly as we do, but the. Um, you know, our next step in this is to develop the TIP policy document, which is the rules that govern the, uh, the TIP selection. Um, and we really need to have that document prepared and ready by the end of this year, 2017, because our hope is that we can do a call for the, if, if we go this route, this dual model co concept, um, we would do a call for the regional projects probably in the first quarter of 2018 
and um, once the uh, regional call is done and projects are recommended, then the sub-regional forums would then s begin to their process in selecting projects. And with the whole concept of having this all completed probably by, by the end of calendar year 2018, and uh, we would go through our public review process and all that kind of good stuff and have the TIP approved in March of 2019. Uh, the last slide I had is just an update on the other recommendations. Um, just in, just respect your time on this. I might, it's, it's in your packet if you have any questions. I think I hit on most of these already. Um, so if you have any questions, I'll be happy to address those. With, with that, I am complete. Thank you, sir. I'm sure there are no questions. So, oh, <laughs> Director Jones. Well, I was just going to move to comments, but if you, are you taking questions first? Uh, questions or comments, either one okay. is fine. Well, all right. So I, I, I do want to thank the, the TIP working group. This is a heck of a lot of um, time put into this and, and really appreciate it. And I come away thinking this might be a really good idea. And the devil will be in the details. And so I think it's really important that we get this right. I'm, I'm channeling Jackie, but probably for different reasons. Um, when I look back on what worked well with the TIP last time, setting the criteria ahead of time, having objective scoring, like the 75% of the money that went through that process, that was pretty easy. The 25% where sort of politics and, and food fighting happened, where we all got parochial and we tried to get as much money as we could for ourselves, that was the ugly part, right? So I think we should remember that taking out the discretion, like we want flexibility and we want, want local control, and yet when we add in a lot of discretion, that's when things get messy. So having some criteria is really, really important and setting that ahead of time. And I guess since that we have limited federal or limited transportation dollars writ large, I tend to think the highest and best purpose, as much as I love my local jurisdiction and I'm sure that every project we suggest is great, is making sure that we get the, the biggest regional bang for our buck because our transportation system is a system, right? Cross-jurisdictional mobility is key to our economy. And so I look at this and say, okay, the sub-regional allocation might be a great way to go. I would be concerned to put too much money in that and take away from regional. I'm not clear. You talk about encouraging cross-jurisdictional, cross-county projects. I don't see how the sub-regional allocation incentivizes those. So either you create that incentive there or those are regional projects. So it really comes down to how you define region. But I think we need to make sure and create incentives for jurisdictions to work together because there's no guarantee that all of our small, small little parochial projects that we love will add up to a connected transportation system that works well. So I think that's pretty key. Um, how do we measure the benefits? I think that's so important. We, we, and throughout this process, we have to recognize that we never go back and see if the projects we did fund actually met the goals that they said they were going to meet, right? We don't do that. Right. We are talking about evaluating the set-aside programs. That's great. Why aren't we evaluating projects that we funded as well to see if we're actually getting the mobility and congestion relief we want? Right. I, I think that's a key part. Um, and. I, I think you mentioned that for some of this we're funding infrastructure and programs. I think that's pr pretty key. We had that conversation a while ab back about if our goal is, say, increasing mobility, it may be something made of concrete and asphalt will do that, or it might be a program like a community eco pass that gets everybody to ride transit. You don't know. Um, and so I think keeping the, the door open for that is going to be key as well. And since we've just finished Metro Vision, I like the fact that throughout this document we talk about making sure that there's um, a connection between projects and Metro Vision as well as federal requirements and our RTP. I think that connection needs to, to uh, be retained in sub, the sub-regional allocations. Regardless, even if they're local projects that have a local benefit and are locally contrived, they still have to be high-quality projects that add up to something that's good for the region. So in the queue, I have Atchison and then Malay. Director Atchison. Just thinking about the, the makeup of the regional group, 
Kevin, do you have an unlimited budget for personnel? Of course he does. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm being somewhat facetious, but I'm not. So potentially you're looking at seven different boards at seven at sub-regional areas. That's potentially seven groups meeting on the same day. Not likely, but that would mean seven different staff members coming from RTD and CDOT. So when we start to think about how we staff this with other groups, let's be a little bit cautious about how much we commit other organizations to without fully confirming with them that they can actually staff this because that should that could mean that the day you want to have your meeting, you can't have it. But so as you start to think through that process and we start to formalize this, keep that kind of stuff in mind. Director Mullay. I just want to emphasize something. Elise and I are channeling each other. Uh, the the idea of incentivizing regional the regional projects to to work together, I think, is is a really important element. And I'm not sure how you might do that, but I would I would encourage the working group to look at that because communities like we all share borders, and mine I share across Arapahoe County with the city of Centennial, and I can see plenty of opportunities for us to work together. But I also see potentially the municipalities in Douglas and the municipalities in Centennial, excuse me, in Arapahoe County, not seeing the same benefits. So I, I do think that's an important piece of it. And Director Partridge. You know, thinking this through, when, you, when we look at the last tip cycle, I would think you'd say on the right after the vote of the last tip cycle, the county, cities, and towns in Douglas County would probably say, don't change this. <laughs> and I say we did. We did great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be quiet. So, so did the city of Aurora, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, don't change it. But I know our friends from Doug, uh, uh, Adams County may have been, been a little bit different. But with that said, we had to come with our lower lip out and our puppy dog eyes to be able to get that because equity was not there on a previous tip cycles. So, with that, when you look at it now. I think this is a great process to really have the discussion. I think it's wonderful. I certainly think Director Jones, uh, Madam Chair, certainly has hit a lot of buttons that we all have concern with. No doubt there's a lot of discussion going forward. But from the general idea, Douglas County likes the idea, and I think I speak for a lot of the jurisdictions you think. It, it makes a lot more sense. And as for a region as a whole, when we look at when you look at statistics around the country, obviously you look at Utah, how they get things done. We compete from, with Utah as a whole region, not just in one area. So if we have sub-regions that aren't doing well, we're not going to do well as a whole region to compete around the country. So I like the idea about sub-region because it's spreading the peanut butter around, but we also know we have great overall regional projects that are going to benefit us all. Director Brockett. Great. I just wanted to make one point on the sub-regional allocation. You know, of course, the, the board as a whole will have the ultimate uh, authority to approve those projects. Uh, but I imagine we'll give a lot of deference to those uh, sub-regional planning groups. And unless there's an extraordinary reason, we'd probably accept their recommendations. So I think it's really important that we, as a larger board, set out any parameters or criteria that we think are key uh, before we send um, send the sub-regional groups off to go pick their projects. So I just want to make sure we have a robust discussion about what kinds of parameters we set up before those processes get started. Excellent. Mr. Chairman. Mr. X. Thank you, sir. I, I have a couple additional uh, comments. Um, and this first one is probably more me than the group. Um, with regards to uh, you know this whole concept that the what the sub-regional forums would be doing would be making recommendations back to the full board, I think at least in my mind the concept would be that the the chairperson of that sub-regional forum would make a formal presentation back to the full board and explain why those projects were chosen, how they're consistent with the long-range plan and Metro Vision, those types of things, and what the true benefits of those projects are. Um, I think that it kind of just wraps it up and puts a bow on it. And um, and then obviously it'd be you know to the discretion of the board to accept those final final recommendations. The other thing I wanted to point out, and this was it's, it's mentioned in the uh, in the report, that there are two counties that are not like the others within our region, and those are uh, Broomfield County and uh, City and County Broomfield and City and County of Denver. Um, there is a federal requirement that you cannot well. 
it's kind of parsed out a little bit, but it, it's that you cannot suballocate monies directly to any one entity or one mode. Um, but again, it goes further on within that same section that says, well, you can as if it's part of the transportation planning process, right? So I think what that basically, the purpose of that federal reg is that it um, basically there's no backroom deals being done, right? That everything is transparent, open as part of the transportation planning process. We had discussions with Federal Highway and FTA headquarters and the regional office about this concept because that was one of the concerns we had about choosing counties as, a, as the sub-regional forum. And um, the way that we described it was that, well, first of all, the simple fact that the projects are mere recommendations that are coming back to the full board gave them some comfort. The other part of that, within City County of Broomfield, City County of Denver, they will have to establish a, a uh, transparent process, established criteria of how those pro their projects are selected as well. And they will have to have a, a forum of maybe it's departments within, within your city, county, um, and maybe other representation um, to vet those projects. So just kind of FYI, and we'll flush that out more as we go, um, Federal Highways has, um, has agreed to provide us a letter stating what our, um, um, you know, what basically that discussion we had. Um, we don't have it yet. We hope to have it by the board meeting uh, on February 15th, so just FYI. I wanted to share that with you because that is kind of a little odd quirk to this whole thing, but ultimately um, the board will, will approve the selection process within, well, overall, but within those two communities as well, so that it's fully vetted and part of the transportation planning process. I have Director Dyack, but before, I just want to ask real quick, is there anybody on the phone that would like to chime in? Director Dyack. Um, the only uh, other comment I have, and I think this, this, um, this discussion is fantastic, and the, uh, the committee did a great job answering all my questions. Uh, the only thing, uh, CDOT and RTD may participate as non-voting members. Almost, it might be in conflict to Director Atchison, but I view them as a valuable member to be at the table. If we're talking about funding and, and leverage, uh, leveraging dollars, if our dollars are the last in, maybe within the subregion we could, um, you know, tip the, tip the needle if we come to uh, a discussion where we have, you know, five million, which CDOT uh, needs to further a project which is of regional benefit. So to me, I would strongly encourage, I know you can't require, but have them involved in the process, involved in the dialogue at the sub-regional level so we can truly um, solve some regional problems. Other questions or comments? Director Baker. I just want to echo some of the things that uh, um, Director Partridge has said about um, one size not fitting all in a lot of these projects and that um, um, the other comment that was made in the presentation is that the significance of the um, amount of money that's been, I can see uh, value in what you said about to make this work, that the, the amount of money has to be significant, the proportion of money has to be significant to, to overset the, the additional costs or additional effort. And um, I do think that the duration of this should probably, um, that this is the devil in the details, I'm, maybe I'm getting too far ahead, but it, it may need to go more than just one tip cycle. It may need to go, uh, at least two tip cycles uh, in order to make sure that we work out all the bugs and get everything so that everybody's happy with the way it works. Great. And actually that's a really good comment, that last one in particular, because that is one of the things that uh, staff recommended is that this just isn't an experimental deal for one tip cycle, that we kind of make uh, some sort of commitment that is it is going to be for multiple tip cycles so that we don't you know we can improve on it and change it, but that it we don't we don't uh, throw it out after the first tip cycle. No, thank uh, you, sir, for highlighting that. Yes, I I forgot to mention. Other questions or comments? So um, I guess I would entertain if anybody has a recommendation moving forward of what the uh, makeup of this tip working group looks like. We talked about 
uh, of course, it's going to come back to the Board of Directors for final decisions. Um, the current TIP working group has suggested that they stay engaged, which makes a lot of sense. There's been some conversation about board members being a part of that working group. Uh, what, do, what do people want to talk about? Director Jones and then Director Malay. Shocking. I know, I know. shocking who, that it's you two. Who wants I know. to talk? <laughs> um, I, I guess I would support keeping the existing working group. I love all of us, and I think we all do great work sitting around this table. We also add a level of politics and geography and, a, and less of a subject matter expertise on the technical piece of this. So I think the, pro the process would work better if we weigh in at after the working group reports out rather than sit on the working group. Director Malay. I completely agree and was going to suggest the same thing. The only thing I would like to see is the working group develop a schedule so the board has some sense, a schedule with kind of a, a goals and objectives to be reached and so that we, this doesn't, they don't work on this for, not that they're going to, four months and then dump everything on there. As you move forward with it, I do think it's important to bring the board into the process on some of the key decisions so I would love to see a schedule be brought back to the board I completely agree the existing body should continue to work on it excellent and I'm assuming that along with that schedule it's going to be uh, not only a schedule of events but where they are in the process so that we don't wait till the 11th in. hour and derail them but that's what I mean they when they're going to be as part of that when they're bringing it back Schedule yes. in when you're coming back to the board for key decisions. Definitely. Director Duzal. I would just like to see a representative from Boulder County from a municipal government in addition to just the one county representative here. And I don't know if that's because our TAC people just didn't participate or whatever, but I'd like to see somebody from one of the municipal towns uh, government uh, staff be on the working group. Sure, we can do that. Um, yeah, j just so everybody knows, and how that how that that, that tip review work group was made up, um, it was spatially throughout the entire region. Every county had the opportunity to appoint two. Now I say county little c again. So everybody had a, had the opportunity to appoint two members, and um, and actually I think Boulder County is the only one that, that has one. So uh, that would be what I had asked: is that we added a, a second one for yep. Boulder County? Thank you. We can, we can, we'll. We'll go and search. <laughs> well, I think that we weren't not, not putting any of the directors on. Right. We were actually, so I can get right. some staff person, definitely. I'll make sure their <laughs> body is, or name is, it added to this. From what right? municipality? Like <laughs> Superior or? <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> we'll talk amongst ourselves. <laughs> Other questions or comments? So with that recommendation, is everybody comfortable moving forward with the way, it, uh, the way we've talked about it? So I think staff has direction. Great, thank you, sir. Um, that you is all. the extent of our agenda for this evening. Is there any miscellaneous matters for members? Director Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a, a quick note, I wonder if you might entertain a moment of silence uh, for the tragedy that we had with RTD and the security officer, uh, Scott von Lanken, who was murdered last night. I, I was not aware of that. I would. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, an RTD, a private security officer for Allied, uh, was down at Union Station last night giving directions to two women, telling them how to get the light rail, and a man walked up behind him and shot him in the head. Wow. A 37-year-old uh, young man, former police officer, retired and moved here, uh, pastor up in Longmont uh, in his personal life, and I just thought it was fitting. I don't see uh, Bill Van Meter. I don't know if anybody's here from RTD, but it was a horrible day at RTD today. I'm sure it was, and I would certainly entertain a moment of silence. Thank you. Anything else for the good of the cause? Director Atchison. Yeah, just a quick piece because we do have a legislative review uh, going on. As you recall, at our last meeting, we said SB 45, which was the litigation piece of construction defects, was on a monitor. 
two more bills dropped this afternoon. So if you have staff, look at SB 156 and SB 176. Those are brand new today. We had expected at least four to drop today. Those are the only two I have numbers on as of right now, SB 156 and 176. So have your staff look at those. Director Crispin. Since Baghdad is Can you pull the mic? Oh, I'm please. sorry. Thank you. Since Baghdad is our sister city, um, are all programs other than the Internet program now terminated for the foregoing future? So generally, um, as far as the Baghdad program goes, we uh, host groups that are brought here by other than sister cities at this point, um, World usually through World Denver. So we don't necessarily have um, what you might call a program mm -hmm. at this point. It's just really we, we do hosting of groups that come in through other groups. For those of us who have hosted people from Baghdad, for the Dr. Cog, should we be reaching out to those people? Should we? I think that it. To I them? think that if they gave you their contact information, then it is appropriate for you to contact them individually. Okay. If not, I I wouldn't know how to get that information, and it might not be available to us. Okay. Alrighty. So open house upstairs, seventh floor. And at 5.41, we are adjourned. <laughs>